Right. And then I'm happy to and excited actually to um, share with you our, our speaker today, Ryan Jackson, um, a leading authority on the National Electric Code. He is uh, inspector in Salt Lake City and he's also a teacher in several states and university. He's been involved with the um, National Electric Code for a vast majority of, of his career and he's written and edited over 25 books on the code. Um, Ryan is going to speak to us today about um, some of the top things that you need to know on the new National Electric Code published by the National Fire Protection Agency. This new edition of the National Electric Code was published um, I think late uh, last year, September-ish of 2016. Been adopted by one state so far, but uh, great in demand from all people in the electrical industry regarding the changes and ensuing adoptions for your state. Um, Ryan uh, is working with Red Vector and has developed several online training courses that will help you learn, understand, and implement um, the new National Electric Code. We've produced over 10 hours of training so far and have another six hours coming out here later in the year. Uh, but with that, without further ado, I'd like to turn the ball over to Ryan and uh, we can jump into today's, to today's presentation. Thanks so much and take it away, Ryan. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, once I get going, I'm not going to be able to see any of you guys chatting to me, so I just uh, I just posted a thing. Can you guys hear me okay? Can I just get an audio check before I really start taking over? Because once I do, I won't be able to see. Perfect. Jeremy, uh, Jeremiah, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, go ahead and get going then. So, why you need to train on the 2017 National Electrical Code? Let me get my screen up, my little laser pointer out. So, Red Vector asked me, <clears throat> you know, Ryan, I, I need you to have like three or five reasons why you need to train on the National Electrical Code, on the 2017 version of the code. And what's difficult with that is, like, I'm the last guy in the world that you would want to ask what time it is, because I'll tell you, like, how to build a watch and how the Egyptians made sundial. Like, when, you're, when you get paid to teach for eight straight hours, you learn to kind of drag your answers out a little bit. You know, I mean, you don't get a lot of 30-second answers from me. So when, when I was told I need, like, three or five reasons, oh, geez, I put pen to paper, and I wrote down, like, 20 things before I even, <laughs> before I even got myself in check. And I thought, geez, how am I going to whittle this down to, to three or five things? And I really stepped back and I looked at it and I thought, you know, in all honesty, it really does boil down to three main things, the three ways that the 2017 is going to impact you. And I don't care what kind of work you're doing. If you're a residential electrician, if you're a mom-and-pop shop, if all you do is service calls, I don't care if, you're, uh, if you work at a hospital, a staff, if you're a design professional, these are probably the three main reasons that all of it really matters. Money, safety, and legality. Those are the three main ways that the 2017 is going to impact you and your organization. So why do you need to train on the 2017 code? Well, I mean, I guess you don't have to. You could, you could be this guy here. You know, a friend of mine sent me this picture. Here's our service van, you know, quality service since 3 o'clock last Tuesday. We're ranked number one in the industry by the owner of the company and his mother. And by the way, if you see this vehicle driven in an unsafe manner, please don't call us. It's just going to raise our insurance rates. So, you know, I mean, listen, you can be this dude if you want, and that's okay. You know, this, this guy's probably happy, but the industry is going to pass him by. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the electrical industry, when, when we chose the electrical industry as a profession, I think we all agreed that this is not a job that you just learn once and then you're set for the rest of your life we have to continually evolve because the industry continually evolves. We have to maintain on the cutting edge or the industry simply passes us by. That's what happens. You know, I was, uh, I was teaching a class in, uh, in Maryland last week, had a great time with some friends there, and uh, we were talking about licensing and voltages and regulations. And, you know, I said one of the things that, that you've got to notice in, in the 2014 and the 2017 is our industry is really taking a turn. We're, we're looking a lot more at low voltage than we ever did before. You guys might remember in 2014, we added rules about using the actual ceiling grid as a conductor, where we energize the grid ceiling in an office building, and we actually use it as a wire. We connect our, our uh, speakers and intercoms and, you know, low voltage lighting perhaps. 
all of this actually goes right to the suspended ceiling. We can run surveillance cameras off of it. You know, our industry is really changing. And if you're not keeping up to speed with things like that, again, the industry is simply going to pass you by. You know, when I teach on the 2017 changes, one of the topics that I talk about is low voltage towards the end of the day in Article 725. And I mention how, you know, and I, I say this every time I teach, I say, guys, listen, as soon as I say low voltage, some of you guys are going to shut your brain off and you're going to stop listening because you don't care. And I think that's a big mistake because that's where our industry is heading. If you don't understand and, and really if you don't embrace the changes that occur in our industry, then the industry is simply going to pass you by like you're standing still. And that's, that's kind of a, a frightening concept, but I, I stand by it. I, I think it's true. So the main reasons that we need to stay abreast of all these topics, money, safety, and legality. So let's talk about money. You know, that's, that's probably my least favorite part to talk about in the code. I mean, you know, I would love to tell you that, that I just do what I do because I love doing it and I love helping people, and, and that's true. But, you know, I also, I also like to eat, and I also like to have a house. <laughs> you know, money matters. I mean, it does, right? Oh, money's not everything, right? Yeah, I know it's not everything, but, but it allows me to live. I mean, money, money has to be discussed, and money is a big part of why you need to be trained on newer code requirements. So what I mean by that, there's a few different things. Failing to comply with the 2017 code is expensive. Uh, equipment that's required by new code rules not being bid into the cost of a job, that's expensive if you're an electrician. If you're a design professional, equipment that's required by new codes that's not factored into the design of a wiring system is expensive. There are certain changes that we're going to be talking about in the 2017 code that you just you can't miss these things if you're designing a building or you're bidding a building. Now, I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to go into great depth on the technical changes of the code. I'm going, to, I'm going to scratch the surface of them, certainly. But, you know, this is more of why we need to stay abreast of it, not why it changed and different things. But let me give you some examples of the things that have changed in the 2017 that would cost you money if you miss them on a bid or if you miss them on the design of a job. This is a change that was made in 210.8b, which talks about GFCI protection. Now, you know, I, I know some of you guys are electricians that are watching, some design professionals, but some of you aren't really in the electrical industry at all. You're, you're, you're working at facilities and you're, you're shot callers and decision makers. So the GFCI, you know, that's the receptacle that you would find in your bathroom, in your kitchen, uh, outside, that has the buttons on it, the test and reset button. GFCIs do one thing. They stop an electrical shock from becoming a fatal electrical shock. You can still get shocked on GFCIs, but you don't get killed on a GFCI protected circuit. That's what the whole idea is. See these, uh, this receptacle right here with the buttons? That's what we're talking about. Let's talk about a change that happened that you'll need to be aware of. So this is for commercial. This isn't for houses. Down here at the bottom. Where GFCI protection is required by 210.8 B1 through B10, and that would be outdoors, kitchens, near sinks, things like that. Where the GSCI is required, it applies to all single phase receptacles that, and now you can see the yellow text, that's showing a code change. All single phase receptacles rated 150 volts or less to ground and 50 amps or less, as well as three phase receptacles rated 150 volts or less to ground and 100 amps or less. Okay, previous editions of the code, it was this kind of configuration that required GFCI protection in certain applications. The receptacle that we have, you know, millions of and you see it 100 times a day, those ones in certain applications required GFCI protection. Now in the 2017, that's been greatly expanded. You can see the ones that I have circled here on the left. Let me go down to column 14 where it says 125 slash 250. And I'm going to move over here to the 30 amp column. I'm not sure how easy that is to see, but you might recognize that as a dryer receptacle, a 30 amp, 250 volt rated receptacle. It's actually rated 125 slash 250, which means what? 150 volts or less to ground, 50 amps or less. That receptacle would now require GFCI protection if it's installed in a commercial building 
in an area that requires GFCI. Same thing if I move over here to the right, our dryer receptacle. That also would require GFCI protection if it's installed in a commercial building in an area that requires GFCI protection. So let me give you an example of that. Back in, I think it was the 2005 code, we added a rule that said you have to protect certain receptacles in a commercial kitchen, all 125 volt, 15 and 20 amp receptacles. So the receptacle for this fridge back here, this one back here, those both have to be GFCI protected. And I would guess that maybe half of these attachment plugs that are hanging down, pardon me, the cord connectors that are hanging down, those probably have to be GFCI protected as well. Now the equipment back here, this cooking equipment, where the person's standing, those more than likely did not require GFCI protection. Well, now they very well could, depending on what the voltage and the current rating is if they're cord and plug connected. Same with this cord right here. I'm looking at scale, it's significantly bigger than the cord next to it, and its, a, it's a cord connector is larger. That one probably did not require GFCI protection, but it would now. Now, I'm an instructor, I'm a part-time inspector. I don't really shop for parts anymore, that's not my world, so I had to, I had to go online and figure out, okay, what, what would the price difference be? Let's say that this thing right here is like a, a range receptacle, you know, a, a 250 volt, 50 amp. Let's say it's a, let's say it's a three pole though because this requires, this, this applies to three phase. In the 2014, that breaker, and I just Googled this, you know, check the prices, that would cost anywhere from 70 to 150 bucks, somewhere in that neighborhood. The GFCI version of that breaker costs 750. So it's five times, but anywhere from five to 10 times the price of the standard circuit breaker. That's a pretty significant change when you factor in all four of these pieces of equipment, plus these cords that are dangling. You know, we got several $5,000 or so worth of code change right in that photograph. That's something that if you're an electrician and you miss out on a bid, that's gonna hurt. If you're a design professional and you miss out on the design and you have to deal with it through an RFI, that's gonna hurt. It's not gonna hurt nearly as much if you're a design professional as this change might. Here's 210.12, which talks about AFCIs. AFCI protection is now going to be required for all 120 volt, 15 and 20 amp branch circuits supplying outlets or devices in the guest rooms or guest suites of hotels and motels. So essentially, every 120 volt circuit in guest rooms and guest suites of hotel motels is now going to require AFCI protection. So this would not, you know, probably would not apply to an air conditioning circuit or a heater, a heater circuit, depending on the voltage and current. But let's say I've got five of these in each hotel room. The price of a normal breaker down here on the bottom is about five bucks. Let's go ahead and just call it five bucks. The price of an AFCI up here on the top is about 30. And you times that by 100 different hotel rooms, we're talking some serious money. That is not something you would want to miss if you're designing that building. There goes the profit on it. So the NEC can cost you money if you don't know about the code changes. Now it can also save you money, and we're gonna talk about that here in a minute, but it can cost you money if you don't know the changes. It really depends also on, you know, sometimes we talk about money and it, it's a relative thing. If, you, if you're an electrical contractor and there's just you and one or two other persons, Man, everything counts. You know, and, and the, the price of the receptacle counts, the, the labor counts, the little materials, the big materials, all of it adds up. If you're a bigger electrical contractor, you know, maybe the, the price difference between receptacles and things, maybe that's just not that big of a deal to you. But the labor cost is a big deal. Well, this can be a labor issue. This is for meeting rooms. The whole new concept that we've never talked about in the code before. We're actually going to start requiring receptacles in certain commercial applications for meeting rooms. So for small meeting rooms like the one here in the photograph, we're actually going to start requiring receptacles. Again, that's something that you don't want to miss if you're bidding a project. A big change that a lot of people aren't talking about in 422.6, 
this could be a this could be a huge thing. Listing of appliances. All appliances that are part of an electrical installation must now be listed if they operate at 50 volts or more. Now I'm showing a picture here of a garage door opener. That's easy to you know. Listed, by the way, just so we're speaking the same language. That means I, I develop my product and I send it to a testing laboratory, maybe UL or Intertech or you know TUV or somebody, somebody that tests products. They run the tests on it. It passes. They put their sticker on it. You know, they label the equipment. That's a listed product. Well, not everything in the code has to be listed. In fact, there's a lot of things that don't have to be listed. Appliances, generally speaking, did not have to be listed until the 2017 code. So now I have to make sure I'm using listed products. Well, that's easy enough if I'm talking about a garage door opener here in the picture. You know, and appliances, <laughs> appliances is tough. A lot of people, you think of an appliance. What's an appliance? Even me, I'm an electrical guy. Even me, I immediately start thinking like blenders, toasters, hair dryers. Well, those aren't really code things. The code covers installations. You know what I mean? Parts of installations that are appliances. So a garage door opener. I'll tell you what else might be an appliance. We had in the Salt Lake City area, we had this massive commercial building. It was, uh, it was about a million and a half square feet, huge footprint, single story, and it was a cabinet shop. If you bought cabinets from Lowe's or Home Depot, you were going to have your cabinets fabricated at this particular cabinet shop in West Jordan, Utah. And I consulted on it at customer-owned substation, and I mean, it was a phenomenal building. They had miles of stainless steel, uh, stainless steel piping going all through the building for pneumatic tools and everything, state-of-the-art equipment everywhere. Now, a lot of the tools, like, you know, I say tools, giant table saws and panel saws and things, a lot of these things came from overseas. Those are appliances, believe it or not. I mean, you know, it's easy to think of appliances as a garage door opener. Well, a gigantic table saw that costs, you know, $100,000 or a million dollars, that too would be an appliance. Under the 2017 code, that has to be a listed product. That's something that you would probably want to know before you got too involved in it, right? But now you're going to have to get a field label and everything else, all of that costs time and it costs money. So missing things on a bid, missing things in the design, these things are all cost, uh, you know, not cost effective. Failing to comply with the code is expensive. Another example, money to fix mistakes that are called out on an inspection. So now we're really talking about labor price for the most part. So here's some examples. They made a change in 110.14D, and this is a big issue in the industry. Everybody's talking about this. It says, look, if a tightening torque is indicated on equipment or in the manufacturer's instructions, a properly calibrated torque tool must be used unless the instructions provide other options. Okay, so here's a person. He's doing some, some prefab work at, at his shop but he's tightening all of these terminations in this panel, and he's actually using a properly calibrated torque tool. That's what this thing is in his hands. Once he gets done doing these terminations, he actually marks the breaker, and then they have a quality control group that goes around and checks them all. This is a big shop in Salt Lake. If I'm an inspector and I look at that, I go out on site and I say, hey, let me see the torque tool. They can show me the torque tool that they used. They've got all the specs. They can, they can show me the literature. They say, look, it's you know, 32 inch pounds to 35 inch pounds, I know that they've done it correctly. What happens if I go to a job site as an inspector and I say, hey, let me see your torque tool? And he says, well, I don't have one. Well, I'm going to assume that this rule was not satisfied, right? <laughs> Obviously, if you don't even have the tool to do it, then you certainly didn't follow this rule. Think of how many terminations. Think whatever, I don't care what building you're sitting in right now. Think of how many terminations are in it. I'm, I'm in my house right now, and I'm thinking, geez, every receptacle, every switch, the panel boards, the breakers. I mean, you know, I've got, what, a 1,000 terminations? Some of you guys might be in a high-rise office building. You guys might have over a million terminations. Who knows? Can you imagine getting written up? Your inspector comes in and says, hey, why didn't you torque your terminations? The code requires it. You didn't do it. I need you to go back through, and I need you to torque every termination in this building. You want to talk about costing some money, I can't, <laughs> I can't even imagine how much that would cost to pay multiple electricians to walk around with that torque tool. Every termination in the panels, 
the switchboards, the switch gear, the receptacles, the switches, all of those. If they have a, tightening, a tightening torque on the equipment or in the instructions, this rule says you have to do it. Let me tell you something. You'd better know that going in. That's a rule that you want to know about before you get written up on an inspection. Here's another one, simple little thing. Even if you're not an electrician, we've all seen these things, cable ties. We can use these things for securing and supporting cables and flexible raceways, you know, nice little piece of equipment. There's a change in the 2017 that says that, you know, you don't have to use cable ties, but if you choose to, they have to be a listed product. And they have to be identified for securing and supporting. Okay, so you've used these throughout the whole building, securing your MC cable to the ceiling grid and your cables inside the stud walls. The inspector comes by and he says, hey, I want to see the bag that those cable ties came in. Okay, let me go out to the truck. So show them the bag that they came in. It's not listed. All right, well, you've got to go back through the whole building and, buy, you know, first you've got to go to the store, buy cable ties that are listed, and you got to go back through and resupport, resecure all of your wiring. In the meantime, the general contractor's furious because he wanted to hang drywall over the weekend, and now we can't do that. You've got a reinspection scheduled, but the inspection department is out two days. So now it's three days later before you can hang drywall. The whole project is behind three days because of something simple, like using the wrong cable ties. By the way, they not only have to be listed, they have to be identified for securing and supporting. So maybe I, as the inspector, I don't even have to ask you for the bag. I can just look at it. Do you see that S on the screen? S22, S7, S4, S3, S11? That's what that S is for. That's identifying that these are for securing and supporting. This is a rule you need to know about. You know, getting written up on it might not cost you a fortune in materials, but the labor cost to go back through it is going to be huge. Same thing here. This is for tamper-resistant receptacles, and we're going to talk about this again here later on, but this is a change about elementary and preschools. 15 and 20 amp, 125 and 250 volt non-locking receptacles in preschools or elementary schools must be listed as tamper-resistant. If you didn't know that that was a code rule, I can't imagine putting in, <laughs> I, can't even, I don't even like thinking about this, you put in all the receptacles in this whole building. The inspector comes in for final inspection and says, hey, uh, you got the wrong receptacles in every single one of these. Rip them all out and replace them all. I, I well, you know, and some of you guys, you know, who cares? I don't, I don't do schools. Well, all I do is hospitals or what? It, it, it's not just schools where this got added. This also got added in healthcare facilities, uh, the waiting rooms, corridors, Business offices and similar locations of medical, dental, and outpatient facilities must be, must be tamper resistant. We also added it to dormitories. We added it to uh, uh, areas awaiting transportation, like hotel, like uh, airport terminals. We added it all over the place. So this is one of those things that, you know, if I'm a, if I'm the inspection department, I'm not. I might not be looking that closely on the plan review at what kind of receptacles you have specified. And you know, to a certain extent, I have to say, look, that's your job. That's your job as the electrician, as the designer, you deal with that. I come out to do the final inspection and all of these are wrong. Sorry, you got to rip them out. Now, that's the bad news. There is some good news in knowing about the code, not just in preventing losing money, but taking advantage of the code. Money saved by knowing what the code allows as well as what it requires. You know, some people, you, you always hear this, oh, I, I don't wire to the minimum code. You know, that's, hey, listen. We all wire to the minimum code when it comes to certain things. I don't know anybody that triples the size of their wire just for fun. You know, so when I start talking about saving money by using what the code allows, that doesn't mean you're a bad electrician or you're cheap or you're trying to take advantage. I think that's being smart. Let me show you some code changes that are going to let you save money by knowing what the code allows you to do. This is a change that they made in 310.15b7. This is where it says you can use smaller conductors, smaller cables, for certain dwelling units. So the, the wires coming out of this breaker and feeding the individual units of these apartments, right, or townhouses. That's what this section is talking about. We can use smaller wires for houses and residential, 
than we than we have to for commercial because we, we understand a little bit more about load diversity and different things in residential. The problem was this has always been limited to 120, 240 volt single phase systems. So you could use it for a house or a duplex. You could use it for multifamily townhouses and apartments, sure, depending on the apartments. But if you're talking about a big apartment complex, you're probably doing a three phase 120, 208 volt service. And if that was the case, then you couldn't use the smaller conductor sizes. They changed that in 2017. I, I was absolutely floored. I, I'm glad, I think it's great. But this rule now applies to 12208 as well as 12240. So now if this is a, a three phase service, I can actually use smaller wires coming out of each of these breakers. That's a significant cost difference, especially when you couple it with this change right here that we also made in the 2017 in Article 338. 338 talks about SE cables, so all of these gray cables going through here. I'm guessing this is maybe like a four-story apartment building. What we had in previous editions is we had a rule that said, listen, if you put this wire in a wall or a ceiling and you insulate the wall or the ceiling, then you have to pretend that those cables are only good for 60 degrees. Even though they're not, you have to pretend that they're only good for 60 degrees. We changed that into 2017. Now it says, listen, if you've got tiny SE cables, 10 gauge and smaller, by the way, <laughs> I've never seen that in my life. I've never seen a 10 gauge SE cable. I'm sure they make them, but I've never seen one that small. If it's a tiny 10 gauge SE cable, then that 60 degree rule applies. If it's a larger cable, which is all of them, then you can go ahead and use the 75 degree column, assuming that that's what the conductors are. Between those two rules, you might be able to go from 4 aught under the 2014 to 2 aught in the 2017. That's a substantial difference. Now, I don't know what people are really paying for cables, but I, you know, I just went to Home Depot online, grabbed a screenshot, okay? 250 feet of 4 aught costs 950 bucks. 250 feet of 2 aught costs 670. So that's 250 feet. So you're saving about a buck and a quarter a foot, give or take, times five stories, you know, a hundred, couple hundred units. You're talking about a substantial cost saving. And that's all simply by knowing the code change and knowing what the code now allows that wasn't recognized in the 2014. I'll give you a couple more examples here really fast. We made a change in Article 501 that says in class one division two locations, we can now use threadless fittings. <laughs> Where was this when I was, I, I did a bunch of threaded conduit work. When I was learning tools, I did a bunch of threaded work. And I'm here to tell you, if you've never really ran threaded pipe, and I mean ran it, right? Not just you put in a stick, I mean you did a whole job in threaded pipe. Let me tell you something, that is a whole different ball game. It, it's barely even the same sport as running EMT. You might be a wizard at running EMT conduit. You bend it, you, you can do whatever you want with EMT. When it comes to running threaded pipe with threaded fittings, that's a whole different skill set. And it is so much more labor inclusive, labor involved. Now we don't need to do this in class one division two locations and hazardous locations. This is a massive change if you do industrial work. I mean, this is a big, big code change, and it's one that you'd want to know about by, to, by, by keeping up to date. Some of you guys might do a lot of healthcare. Maybe you do hospitals. For all I know, maybe you work at a hospital as maintenance staff. There's a really obscure rule that it, it's been in the code for the last 30 years that says, listen, when you're above the ceiling of a patient care area, you still have to use special wiring. The lights in a patient care area, they have to be fed by special cables. Now, some of you guys might be shaking your head. Trust me, you, you almost have to read it with a, mic, with a magnifying glass. 517.13b, and it used to be exception two, now it's exception three, it did require a special wiring method. It doesn't anymore in the 2017 code. You know, I, I like being an inspector. 
but I hate it when I have to write somebody up and they have to rip stuff out and it's going to cost a fortune. I hate that. That's part of the job, so you do it, but I hate it. I have made so many people rip out wiring above the ceiling of patient care areas. I'll never have to do it again because of this code change. So another, you know, again, taking advantage of code changes to save some money. The last one that I'm going to talk about is another big one. I noticed, too, when I was looking at the list of audience people, there's somebody from the city of Las Vegas. You're probably well aware of this. Um, this is a change to the requirements of conduits and raceways on rooftops, conduits, raceways, and cables. Over the past 10 years, the code has evolved to basically, long story short, to require larger conductors on raceways because if I, or on rooftops. You know, if I walk up to the roof here and I put my hand on this conduit, it's certainly going to be a lot hotter up there than it was down on the ground. So it stands to reason that the wire inside of that raceway is also going to be hotter if it's on the roof than it is on the ground. Well, that's what, I hate to use the word common sense, that's what common sense would tell us. What we found out is common sense wasn't completely accurate. We've done a lot of research and surprisingly, this just is not the issue that we thought it was. So in 2017, I don't have to have this massive temperature correction factor for rooftop installations. Now, some of you guys are thinking, oh, who cares? I don't want to be on the roof anyway. Well, <laughs> what if your job, what if your world is doing solar? If all you do is solar, that's a big deal. So we pretty much got more or less got rid of the rooftop issue in the 2017. That is a huge money saver. Let's keep going. Huge amounts of money can be lost if an incident occurs and the, and the installation is out of compliance. Okay. Just because you put it in and just because the engineer specified it and just because the inspector passed it doesn't mean that it complied with the code. We're all humans. We all miss things. I'm an inspector. I'm, I probably miss something every day. Let's go back to that elementary school. You have to have tamper-resistant receptacles. Well, the guy who installed it didn't know that. The engineer didn't know, and the inspector didn't know. So they put in regular receptacles. What if a kid puts something inside of that receptacle and gets injured? Now we're talking a lawsuit, and now we're talking legal culpability. We're talking massive amounts of money. You know, some of these changes, like, oh, who cares, Ryan? Save $5 on a receptacle. Well, <laughs> okay, when that kid goes to the hospital, that's not going to cost $5. That's a lawsuit. Or I'll give you another one. Here's a change in Article 408 that requires these two yellow things on some panels to protect workers against an arc flash or an arc blast. If I don't have these installed and somebody gets injured and an attorney says, hey, why weren't those installed? You know, now we're probably talking a, a lawsuit in the millions of dollars. So that's a big issue. So money is a big part of why we need to stay abreast. It, it kind of segues into safety as well. You know, when we talk about safety, some people forget that the whole purpose of the code is safety. That's why it exists. Compliance with the code ensures a safe installation. So we added some safety requirements and we modified some others. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of them here. But remember this, the whole purpose of the code is safeguarding of persons and property from the hazards that arise from the use of electricity. This was a fire that I took a picture of, you know, 10, 15 years ago. This was a low voltage lighting system, almost burned the building down. That's what we're trying to protect against. That's why the code exists. So let me just give you a couple of examples of some things that changed as it relates to safety. Ever since 2002, there's been a requirement to mark certain equipment to warn qualified persons about the dangers of working energized in that equipment. We expanded the rules in 2017 to give electricians additional information so that if they have to work on it, they're better equipped to know what kind of personal protection equipment they might have to have and what the safe work practices are. Now, by the way, if you're interested, this is the change only applies to 1,200 amps or more service disconnects. But here's what we're trying to warn people against. Here's an electrician working on this piece of equipment. We need to let this individual know that if something goes wrong, it goes very wrong. So we need to tell them what kind of explosion they might be looking at, what kind of equipment they might need to be wearing. So we expanded the safety requirements to tell electricians about that. Another change that we made is a safety requirement 
for crawl spaces. And man, I'll, I'll tell you, I am so glad they put this into the code. Lighting outlets in crawl spaces must be GFCI protected up to 120 volts. Okay, take a look at the guy in the photograph here. He's crawling around in his crawl space. Now this crawl space happens to be concrete, but a lot of them are dirt. Either way, this guy is as electrically vulnerable as you could possibly be. I mean, this, this photograph actually gives me the chills because if this guy gets shocked, it's going to be, it's going to be very, very bad because of his four points of contact. Here's what we're concerned about. He's crawling through there, runs into one of these lamp holders, and breaks the light with his back. That thing is still on. It's still energized. It's still 120 volts. And if you get shocked by that, when you're in a situation like this, well, according to the substantiation for this change, the death rate is higher than the injury rate. Let me say that again. The death rate is higher than the injury rate. Your odds of being in that accident are higher than you're going to die than you are getting hurt. This is not a good change. This is a great change. This is the kind of safety improvement that drives the entire NEC. This is the kind of thing that you need to know about, right? Ensuring safety, not just of electricians like the arc blast incident, but uh, the safety of the occupants. Let me give you another example really quick of a safety, uh, a safety increase. This is in Article 240. Now, it's got an effective date of January 1st, 2020, but it's for large fuse enclosures, rated 1,200 amps or more and, and some certain conditions. Let me just kind of tell you the bottom line here. This is a photograph. This is the same piece of equipment with two different stickers on it. This is at a power, uh, power plant that I teach at. Over here on the left, it says, listen, the arc flash hazard boundary is 200 feet, and the incident energy is 71 calories. Without getting too involved, let me just say this. 71 calories, that means it's a closed casket. I mean, I hate to say it. But if you're in that incident, uh, yeah. What kind of personal protective equipment can I wear to work on this? You can't. There isn't enough personal protective equipment in the world to allow you to work on that piece of equipment. So what they did is they put in an energy reduction switch. And by the way, something like that is going to be required in, in 2020. And it reduced the arc flash hazard boundary from 200 feet down to 7 feet and the energy from 71 calories down to three calories. And look how, look at the equipment I need to wear. Personal protective equipment, fire retardant shirt and pants, face shields, gloves, safety glasses, and hearing protection. That's all you gotta have, right? So it went from this over here to the left to this over here on the right, just by putting in that one switch. You know, this picture, I love this picture, but it freaks me out. <laughs> What if there was a what if there was a, a wiring mistake somewhere on this system? This kid is going to close the switch, and there's going to be a fireball shooting out of it. Let me tell you something. Seventy years ago, whenever this was, they took the picture. You know, <laughs> we didn't think about that kind of stuff. Acceptable risk is something that evolves. This is no longer acceptable. Not even for an electrician, much less a kid. So we evolve in the code as our safety requirements evolve in the industry. So. Safety is a big part of it, and so is legality, which is going to be the last thing we talk about. Compliance with the 2017 will almost certainly be mandatory at some point in the area that you're working. Uh, and the reason I say that is, look, the NEC is adopted in every state of the United States. It's not necessarily statewide, but in every state, the NEC is, in fact, adopted. Uh, licensure typically requires continuing education. So why do you need to keep up on the code? Right? Because your license says you have to, so it's not an option. Now, interestingly, courts don't always care about adoption either. And that's kind of a, put that in your pocket for one second. I'm gonna explain what I mean by that here in a minute. But let's take a look at this adoption map. By the way, if you go to NFPA, you go to their website, they're always keeping up on who's adopting the code. So this was May 1st, 2017, which is the most up-to-date. You can see that uh, Massachusetts has already adopted it. Most other states, the red ones, are all on the 2014 code. But here's what's important. They also have this on the same website. All of these orange states that you can see are currently in the process of trying to adopt the 2017 code. So they're at varying degrees of it, 
but all of those, you know, probably pretty shortly will be under the 2017. And in some areas, it's not even statewide. And when I was teaching in Maryland, you know, one county that I was in, the county that I was actually teaching in was under the 2014. And they were, they were getting ready to adopt the 2017. The county right next door, they were already on the 2017. So eventually, these rules are going to apply to you. So adoption, you know, licensing and CEUs, this is from Utah because that's where I'm from and I'm most familiar with it. But here in Utah, we require 16 hours every two years, and it has to be education covering the National Electrical Code. So your license probably requires it. Now, again, in Utah, our licenses reciprocate with a couple of different states, Arizona, California, a bunch of other ones. Those states might require that not only we have continuing ed, but that the continuing ed is based on the 2017. So there's that part of it. You've also got, you know, we talked about the, the legality. Let's talk about a definition here really fast, and that's culpability. What's the definition of culpability? It's blameworthy, involving the commission of a fault or the breach of a duty imposed by law. Culpability generally implies that an act is performed wrong, but does not involve any evil intent by the wrongdoer. The connotation of the term is fault rather than malice or a guilty purpose. So you doing something wrong that injures somebody might have legal culpability. It doesn't matter that you weren't trying to hurt somebody. It matters that you did hurt somebody. Let me give you an example. I'm in the middle of a lawsuit right now that I, I can't go into a lot of detail because it's ongoing, but an electrician was killed. Uh, it was on a construction site. He uh, got in contact with a certain piece of equipment and, and it killed him. It was energized and he died. This happened in 2014, and the area in which it happened, uh, the code of record was the 2011 code. They were under the 2011. Now, there was a rule in the 2014 that maybe could have prevented it from happening. And the people knew about that rule, but they didn't do it. This is going to be a big part of this court case. Yeah, it wasn't required by the code, but it was best standard of practice, and you knew it was in the code, you just chose not to do it because you didn't technically have to, how culpable are you? I'll tell you, this is the kind of, of financial hit that big facilities are worried about, right? When I teach at an industrial facility, all these panels, these panels have been in this building for 50 years. Back in 2002, we added rules that says we need warning stickers on some of the panels. So they put these stickers on even though they were installed, even though the panels were installed decades before the rule, because it was a safety thing and this facility does not want to have to answer that question in a courtroom saying, listen, you knew the stickers were required. How come you didn't choose to put them on? You need to know about the safety. You need to know about the legal culpability. Let me give you one more example really fast. Airport terminal. You know, you're, you're in an airport terminal and you took the red eye so you're asleep, your kids are running around, what if they stick something in a receptacle outlet? Well, 2017 says that the receptacles in this terminal have to be tamper resistant. Well, you knew that rule, Ryan. How come you didn't abide by it? Even though you didn't have to, why didn't you choose to? You know, it's a tough thing. So really, when you boil it down, all of the above, money, safety, and legality, they all go hand in hand when it comes to the National Electrical Code, all of them together. The last thing I want to talk about, the example, electric shock drowning. This is a big deal. If you haven't been keeping your finger on the pulse of the industry, you might not know what electrical shock drowning is. If you have kept your finger on the pulse, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I just hit, you know, as you can see, I searched it, hit the news button, and took a screenshot. Electric shock drowning, June 15th, June 19th, June 24th, June, you know, let's see here. Uh... Electric shock drowning after a weekend incident at Lake Erie killed a 19-year-old man. Uh, electric shock drowning is a huge issue right now in the industry. We didn't even know about it. We didn't know about the, the whole concept is new to us in the last 10 years or so. So once we find out about that, we start making code changes. So we made huge, huge changes for marinas and boat yards to address electric shock drowning. New breakers being required. New signage being required. So all of these things are driven by safety. So to conclude this, training your employees, 
staff, facility, et cetera, on the 2017 code will save you money. It's also essential to ensuring safety and to lowering your legal culpability. It might also be required by your city, county, or state, and if not, it probably will be in the near future. Now, with that said, we've got about 10 minutes left, and we're going to open it for questions and answers. So let me put the last slide up here so that you can write down our contact information. Bobby with Red Vector, and then myself at the bottom. So any questions that you have in the future, go ahead and talk to Bobby, or if it's a technical question, you can talk to me. I'm going to go ahead and give control back to my friends at Red Vector, and uh, we'll start doing some questions and answers. All right, Bobby, you there? Yep, I'm here. Thanks a lot, Ryan. You got it. So we're uh, we're going to turn through the Q and A here, and please, everybody um, on the on the event here, please go ahead and submit your questions again through the through the chat um, the chat window, the chat log. Hey, Bobby, uh, I was was gonna... Bobby, I, I, I'm terribly sorry. I need to walk away for just two seconds, so I'll, I'll be right back. I apologize. Okay, no worries. So we'll just give that a, a second pause and. Over here in uh, Tampa Bay, Florida, where Red Vector is headquartered, we're going to look through all of these questions that are coming in and pick out a couple to wrap up the session here. So bear with us for, for one second, and we'll get the questions firing. And again, you can still submit your questions through the chat log. While we're waiting for Ryan to jump back on here, a couple of questions have come across regarding um, the 2017 NEC training that uh, that Red Vector has already developed and new 2017 NEC training that Red Vector will be developing uh, over the next few months. Um, like I said, Red Vector has launched uh, 10 hours of NEC 2017 training. And, and by the way, given you know our position in the market, we have uh, 16 hours of 2014, and we still have another 16 hours of 2011 NEC, as most uh, states are still on the 2011 or 2014 codes. But um, for the 2017 NEC, we are covering so far um, communication systems, branch circuit feeder and services, enclosure boxes, hazardous locations, uh, overcurrent protection and grounding and bonding. Uh, and special occupancy so far. And then, again, um, another five, six hours here are going to be coming out in the next month or two, and that will round out the 2017 NEC series for us. Um, in regards to seeing these training courses as well as our whole learning program, which is a couple thousand courses uh, for design and construction professionals, um, we, you can follow up with, uh, with myself from this this email address up here on the screen, or um, we'll be following up with everybody with a post-event um, email communication, which will provide information for you as to how you could potentially utilize our training solution for your, your staff or what have you. So good questions all around that. Um, and Ryan, is Ryan back yet? No, I am back. I apologize. For being here. Oh, no worries. Ryan, a question came in about um, uh, if there's any changes or what are the changes to uh, adding fire sprinklers to residential dwellings? Oh, boy. Uh, well, that's not really an NEC issue, uh, so it, but, but I, I can speak to that. Back in, this is the International Residential Code, actually, by ICC, but fortunately I, I happen to be a building inspector as well. Back in the 2009 edition of the International Residential Code, they actually put that in. So technically, that's been required for nearly 10 years. A lot of areas, Utah included, 
chose not to accept that as a code change. So when we adopted the 2009 International Residential Code, we did not adopt that portion of it. And I think there's a lot of states that have done that. So to answer your question, the code already requires it. But your area might not, because of course every area can, can amend locally, you know, different requirements out of the code. So if you're in an area that doesn't require it, it, it would really be area specific, because it, it's already done by the code. All right, thank you, Ryan. Uh, yep. What about another one here? Does my facility have to update to the new code requirements when we adopt a new version of the code? Ooh, yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, and, and that comes up a lot. So the, the best way to answer that is when you look at the code book in section 90.2A, that's the scope of the code, the code covers the installation of conductors and equipment. So it covers installations. Uh, what you install, needs to comply with the code. So it's not a retroactive code. I don't have to change my wiring system every three years when the code changes. Now, there are some larger facilities that choose to make improvement every three years when the rules change. So like, you know, I had the one picture of the, of the panels with the stickers on them. They chose to put those stickers on because it increases worker safety. They didn't have to, but they chose to. So sometimes, that choice isn't really feasible. You know, in, in 1974, we added a rule that said you might have to have two doors out of certain electrical rooms. Well, that's not an easy thing to just go in later and cut a door into your room. So as much as sometimes we would love to, to stay up, you know, to stay up to speed, sometimes it's not possible. So, you know, no, you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to change your facility to keep up, but a lot of places choose to just to, to increase safety and, and lower their culpability. Makes sense. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Um, yep. I think we have time for one or two more. Here's one. Just came across the chat log. In Article 110.116B, it yep. states permanent label shall be applied to service equipment rated um, 1,200 amps or more. It sounds like labels are not required for service less than 1,200 amps. Can you clarify? Okay. Well, you have 110.16a as well. 110.16a says that all electrical equipment in other than dwellings that's likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized has to be labeled with an arc flash warning sticker. So, but, you know, getting rid of residential, because that's not required. In a commercial building, every piece of equipment likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized has to have the arc flash warning. So that's all of your panels, and then you could argue, maybe that's your transformers, maybe that's your disconnect, your motor control centers, things like that. Those all have to have a sticker. In addition to that, you also have 110.16b, which is for the service disconnect of commercial buildings. And it says, listen, more specifically, if the service disconnect is rated 1,200 amps or more, you not only have to have the sticker, it, it also has to comply with the new requirements to talk about the clearing time, the available fault current, uh, the voltage, and the date that the sticker was applied. Exactly what I would have said, Ryan. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, no, that's great. Looks like we're, we're about out of time here. Um, uh, one more quick one, uh, interesting, honestly, to me, too, is, is there any talk or plans of integrating NFPA 70E and the NEC together, so combining uh, those two uh, standards? Ever hear anything about that? No, and I, I don't think it will happen because the scope is so different. The, the scope of the code is the equipment, the installation, and then, and then NPA 70E, the scope of it is how you work on the equipment. Now, we try to make sure that the rules don't contradict each other because that's, that's obviously a bad thing, uh, and we certainly borrow language from one another especially the rule we just talked about with that warning label, you know, a lot of times what will happen is we'll change the NFPA 70E to add safety requirements like labels, and then we'll take those rules and put them into the NEC. But as far as marrying them into a single document, uh, I don't think that will happen. I mean, who's to say? But, but I, I really don't think so. I think the scope of those two documents is, is just too different to make it into one book that, that really – works well. And you, you have to be really careful. You know, when you change Article 110 or you change definitions or you change Article 90, 
you change the whole code. I'll tell you right now, if you were to incorporate 70E into the National Electrical Code, you would also have to change the scope of the NEC. And changing the scope of what this document applies to, well, you've got to be really careful doing that because once you change the scope of the document, everything changes. Little things like that, changing one word in the scope of the document can change everything. That's why they're so careful in Article 90. You don't see a lot of changes in Article 90 because you better be right before you make a change like that. So I don't think so. I, I don't think it will ever happen. All right. Well, well, thank you, Ryan. We're up against the time here. Okay. Um, and uh, But thank you very much for an excellent presentation and for answering questions at the end here. And thank you to everybody uh, who's been able to join us today for this presentation from Red Vector and Ryan Jackson regarding the 2017 NEC. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but this uh, this recording of the of the presentation will go out to all registrants uh, a day or two after after today, maybe early next week or such, um, so you can share it with with other folks in your organization or review it if you like. And there'll also be contact information for Ryan and/or myself.